So hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Um, Charlie Chikarala, Jason Baldinger are here. Uh, Jason is one of the most Pennsylvania poets that we love. Um, he makes an effort to stay connected to Cleveland, um, active in the small class scene. A uh, table full of his books back there, so check them out before you leave. Um, Charlie, really old friend of the store, um, and as you just probably heard him say, he's not publishing very many books, but recording everything. So um, these two last read here, maybe about a year ago, we're going to something like that. So welcome and thanks for thanks for coming. Yeah. So the sad news of Vertigo's passing. I don't know who Vertigo was. He's a poet's haven. He's an unbelievable person and publisher, and he was a real big supporter of poetry. He also was a poet. And I want to read the first poem for him. Vertigo. What the fuck happened? Last I heard, you were taking over the world. Now you're dead and another poet goes unsung. You weren't just above the petty politics of the Cleveland poetry scene. You were beyond it. Like some galactic space invader who knew their place and was ready to blow it up if necessary. First time I entered your orbit was at Snowetry, when you bought Little Caesars for everyone. When someone needed a ride, you would go out of your way to bring that person to the light. And you even did that for me on a number of clandestine occasions. The news of your passing continues to hit me as hard as lose Berlin. Poets shouldn't die. They should turn into stardust, which I believe is what's happened to you. Never forget your disgruntled beast of an automobile pulling up and the neighbors acting like Gort had just landed and no one quite knowing how to receive this visitor from another planet. What the fuck happened? I'm at a loss as I search the dictionary for words to cover my sadness and not leave me such a wreck. You, Christopher, had the entire poetry scene in a chokehold, and you did it with such gentleness. No one ever felt short change or insulted when you came down the chimney and you ate the cookies and you drank the milk intended for Santa. I hope you get to read that at his memorial. To be continued. <laughs> Abby, just keep recording. Yeah. Friend or foe for James Michael Shepard. Blank page, friend or foe. Typewriter keys, friend or foe. Intellect, friend or foe. I'm nothing but a stranger in this world. I watched him perform astral weeks. I watched him turn heavy feelings into brave clouds. Ego, friend or foe. Principles, friend or foe. Intellectual property, friend or foe. I'll never forget those railroad tracks on Maynard Avenue. How at first they kept me up at night. Then after a couple of days, I couldn't fall asleep without the clicking and clacking. Inspiration, friend or foe. Creativity, friend or foe. Desire, friend or foe. He lived like a defrocked monk or damaged soldier. He picked through the wreckage with a diddly bow sonic screwdriver. He identified with the passion play because he had nailed himself to his own American face long before forced exposure shined a light bulb on his swollen appetite. Time, friend or foe. Madness, friend or foe. Life and death. A necessary evil or just another guiltless pleasure? Thank you.
errands. I put down the pipe, I pick up the Bible, and I put it in a drawer. It's the way it has to be because for God and me to be friends, there must be no subtext existing between us. Words, Jason, they pour through me like a broken bottle or a waterboarded detainee. And I wish I could share these feelings with a special someone, but this special someone is checked out a long time ago. Creativity pushes me toward the sun, like a pair of rickety roller skates or a choker on a disobedient Doberman. The first poem I wrote was about the moon. Every poem since has been about pizza, hmm. in one form or another. I wish to be locked in a one-room country shack with the voice of a generation and a human even more irascible than myself. I swear we could take to one another like anchovies to olive oil or a teacher to chalk. If only a transom window was open long enough for us both to squeeze through to the other side of mourning. I attempted standing the test of time until I became tired and I sat down on Humpty Dumpty's watch. I need to fill the dishwasher, I need to turn it on and empty it into oblivion and beyond. Now I'm thinking about when I was a kid and cutting the grass and how pointless an act of contrition that was. The pipe is staring up at me with its aluminum foil muzzle tempting me to suck myself into unconsciousness. I don't like to smoke until 420 because I'm a stickler for an OCD plan of disassembly. Let's bury the axe in our foreheads and forgive and forget the times that we aren't getting along. And passive aggression is our only means to an end. This uh, poem is for Stephanie. It's called Hope is the Luxury of Those Who Are Unburdened by Fate. We met in Indianapolis, Indiana, when she was 14 and I was 25. We were both doing our best to find our footing. I was in search of a mountain. She was in search of a man who was not her father. Oftentimes, the things that are the easiest to break are the most difficult to mend. There was a roof, and we did lots of singing. Thankfully, we never started a ministry, because more than likely it would have turned into a cult. And who wants to deal with that sort of untenable black hole that warps belief and masks a person's true faith. Joseph, another absentee father, in the amazing Technicolor dream coat, one more straight jacket doing far more harm than good. I remember being lost in the desert. In fact, I just told this story at dinner. I was 90 miles outside of Vegas, and not even another hungry artist could save me from the trials and tribulations of my true calling. You were there. You were wrapped in butcher paper and pixie dust. It was the kind of illusion you will never quite figure out as Penn and Teller bring down the house and another homeless beggar cashes in their unleavened chips. What if the truth is so far out of reach that no matter how fast you run, you'll never quite catch up with the marathon man and all of his seemingly good intentions? She once came to visit me in Columbus, Ohio, years later. We went to see Chicken Run. <laughs> I vaguely remember waking up in the middle of the night, and there she still was. Maybe we were holding on to one another, and that's what caused her to become distant. Because she knew two poets don't make a right, even if they're both so unbelievably tired of being so completely and utterly alone. This poem is for J.B. He knows who he is. Escape Hatch. She tasted like Edward R. Murrow, meaning she was newsworthy. <laughs> 
dedicating this poem to JB because he'll get where I'm coming from. Plus, there won't be any accusatory glances like I stole his best lines. Sitting in only my boxers because when I hit the pipe, I choked so hard, all of my clothes became an impediment. True story. Oftentimes, the only comfort I feel is when I stand over the kitchen sink, retching in time with the final Jeopardy music. He hinted about an escape hatch long before performing his final act of desperation. You just had to listen. I understand you want reparations, but you're not the only ones who were raked over the coals and left in the sun to harden like aggrieved melons. I've been called a misogynist. And I'll probably be labeled a racist for that last line. But none of it is true. I get a bad rap because I don't believe in cutting off the crusts before serving the peanut butter, banana, and bacon sandwiches. Because even rock royalty needs to learn to eat crow. She wanted to play my bagpipes, but I told her my kilt was at the cleaners, and she bought it. Let's focus less on news that is slanted, whitewashed, and pasteurized and hone in on the atrocities laying siege like breadfruit to our planet's core. I'm as out of touch as the next American casualty. If our apathy was worth its weight in gold, we'd all be Donald Trump. She fixed my watch by breaking into my heart and taking my very last ounce of courage hostage. It distracted me just long enough that she was able to make a break for it while break on through to the other side played in my mind. My last poem. We're going to... Thank you. Jason's going to come up and then we're going to read a couple poems back and forth and then we'll have an open. You know, we're here. It doesn't matter how many people are here, we are here. And if you want to read it to the open, you should. This is, um, this is for a, I don't like Facebook, I don't like social media. But I did meet this Scottish lass from Scotland, and I've been writing her poetry for years now. And uh, her name's Katie, and um, the way it works, with, at least in my, 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 for, in my opinion, is if, if you can write a poem for somebody... And um, they, they don't uh, get mad, and they, and they, they you know, I'll keep writing. So. <laughs> this is called Blue Waves, for Cat. In my unexamined imaginings, we're under the covers. Neither one of us is stoned. Neither one of us thinks we're Joan of Arc. When I cup her left breast, she lets out a Woodstock sigh. And I know... I'm either on the right track or she's fallen asleep and I'm getting cozy with her inner child. The riptide called and thanked me for thinking that was one of Lou's coolest songs. It also wanted me to, re to remind me of our agreement and that I wouldn't either <clears throat> and that I wouldn't be pulled beneath the blue waves until I was good and ready to either meet my maker or at the very least willing to remove my mask and show everybody the cartoon I've made of myself. Let's stop pretending poets aren't a special brand of people. Like whiskey, you drink out of a, a brown paper bag. Or porn that shows up at your door, screaming about the good news. Sometimes, I think about her wa walking from the office to home, or vice versa. And it brings a smile to my overdue face. Knowing she really is an actualized person. And that all of these poems, they do actually exist. And they aren't just more daydreams, dressed up as pathetic, purloined orphans, hell-bent on world domination. I like to pull out my ice microphone, like I used to enjoy pulling out my bong. And instead of getting stoned, I stone myself with whatever adjectives I can muster. Much like Sisyphus rolling a boulder uphill, then watching it roll back down again. And again, and again, and again. She likes me, and I'm guessing it's either because of my audacious wit, or because I appreciate things about her that others either don't pick up on, or are just too afraid to point out. For me, for me it's like shooting in the dark. Except in this scenario, 
Neither one of us is smoking a cigar. And when we wake up, there are no dead chickens in our PJs. I like her because I believe she is the true meaning of a maverick and is ready to buck the system whenever the system needs to be dressed down for all the bullshit it inflicts on us each and every day and night. In my inexcusable envisioning, we're sitting in a breakfast nook with a set each of our grandparents. There's juice on the table and what appears to be bacon and eggs, beckoning us to consume it or feed it to the dinosaur that is hanging out beneath both of our slipper feet. My Uncle Anthony is there, which makes sense because he would often drop by on his route when he was delivering the mail. At some point, Katie gives me that look that only she can properly deliver. That means it's either time to leave or kill everybody in the room. We must stand up on our own two feet before it's too late. No one wants to be annihilated before they've done the chosen work they were brought here to do. Dylan, he would make the perfect next Carson because his delivery is second to none. And when he channels his inner Ed Sullivan, all bets are off. I wanted to either suck on her toes or get a bite to eat. But I wasn't in a very communicative mood. So I just wet my finger and I stuck it in Kat's right ear. Because I, I knew, I knew she'd understand exactly what I wanted. Are you introducing him, or is he just coming up? Okay, he's... This next gentleman we met here, I was literally sitting behind him. After he read, I tapped his shoulder, and I said, hey, I thought that was really good. And we started talking, and we started writing some poetry together, and here we are. Here we are. Jason Balzinger. 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 Balzin